good morning. Welcome to Village Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church. And as always, I am thankful and grateful to see each and every one of you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be starting in verse 22. And of course, we will go through other scriptures as well. And we're going to go through a lot of Ephesians to talk about the fact that my life must be about building the church. My life must be about building the church. And the key with this series is understanding that what we're really doing is casting vision for what it looks like to live a life that matters. But we cannot be trusted to order our lives in such a way that it will be what God has designed and what God has defined that all of life must actually be about. But the good news is that God has done that work for us. He has been very clear. He has told us what our lives must be about. The key, though, is in trusting that God's plan is the right plan and trusting that God's design is a sufficient design, trusting that what God says is enough for us. The key problem that most of us have with living the life that God desires for us to live is that we like to define life by our standards. We like to define purpose by our preferences, by our giftings, by our kind of cultural leanings. But God has not told us that that is how we are to look at life. God wants us to define life by His perspective, by His preferences, by what He wants When it comes to living a life that matters, when it comes to pursuing purpose, when it comes to having real vision, so often we reject the exclusivism that Christianity necessarily brings, even if we claim to believe in Jesus as Savior. We prefer kind of a pluralism where purpose is concerned, and that's why we always make our lives about preferences and personalities and and enneagram numbers or personality profiles and love languages. We are so concerned with our self-centeredness, with our selfishness, what we want out of others and what we want out of God, that we run the risk of actually missing the very design of God that He has specifically given into our lives through His revelation. And you don't have to miss it. You can live the life that God wants you to live because God has a vision for your life, friends, that is greater and it is bigger than anything that you could come up with yourself. So many of us settle for transient, temporary, and fading visions for our lives when we were designed for an eternal purpose. And when we in this series have thought about what it means to live for Jesus, what it looks like to actually tap into the power that prayer affords to us and leaving a legacy and even living a life of discipleship, I think what we've been seeing is that the Scripture really funnels all of that down into getting more specific and more specific, where we see that purpose and vision is not a great field of many different things that we can choose, but rather it is about one thing that God has revealed to us. God has told every single one of us that are followers of Jesus, and even those who are not yet followers of Jesus, that of everything that your life could be about, there is one thing, no matter your gifting, no matter your personality, no matter preference, there is one thing that your life must be about. And that one thing is building the church of Jesus Christ. And if you make your aim to do anything other than that, if you make your aim to do anything bigger than that, if you make your aim to do anything greater than build the church of Jesus Christ, you will miss the very purpose for which God has put you in this world, the very purpose for which God has saved you. So I want to look at Ephesians chapter 1. I want to start in verse 22. And he put all things under his feet. And I want to define what he means by that, because there's a he and there's a his, and who are they? The he is God the Father. The his is God the Son. And what he's doing is he is summarizing the eternal purposes that he has kind of unveiled and unpacked through the rest of Ephesians chapter 1. He's talking about the very aim by which God has designed to bring himself glory in this world. And he is saying that through the work of Jesus Christ, through the work of the gospel, God the Father has put all things under the feet of God the Son and given him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
Now, this is the base text for what we're going to talk about today, because I think that in this text, what we see is the very purpose for which the church exists for, and we see the very purpose from which the church will see growth. But really, more importantly for you this morning, what he's actually telling you is this is how you will grow to be the person with the life that God has designed for you to grow and become in this world. And some very important keys here is he talks about the church as the body. Now, this is an analogy that God uses throughout the scriptures as he defines through the Apostle Paul what the church looks like. He actually uses this analogy many times throughout the New Testament that the church is the body of Christ. But what's vital about that is understanding this is really a biological analogy. This is something that we experience in our lives. This morning, I have said a lot of words None of them just came out of nowhere. They all came from right here, my old noggin. They all came from the head. When I move my hands and when I gesture, some of you think I gesture too little, some of you think I gesture too much. But when I move my hands, they're not functioning independently. They are doing what my brain is telling them to do. When I left here earlier, drove to Chester, preached a sermon there, same thing. I didn't do anything independently of my head. And so, so many of us, our vision for the body of Christ begins in the wrong place. We begin by thinking about us and what I want and what I think, and that's where we miss everything. For so many of us, our vision for the church starts in the wrong place. Note what's vital about this is that he says, and the Father has put all things under the feet of the Son. What that means is he's talking about authority. He's talking about subjection. He's talking about submission. He's saying that Jesus has all authority. But he doesn't just say Jesus has all authority over the church because he says all things. He's put all things under his feet. He's giving the preeminence of Jesus Christ above absolutely everything. He's saying that Jesus has authority over everything in this world. Jesus has authority over everything in the universe. Jesus has authority over every square inch of everything that exists anywhere and everywhere. And the way in which Jesus has chosen from the eternal plan of God to show his authority, though, is through a very specific people. And that's where the church comes into place. That when he put all things under his feet through the resurrection, proving that Jesus has all authority in heaven and all authority on earth, he also chose that the way it would be exhibited in a sinful world is through a people who willingly subject themselves to the authority of Jesus Christ in this world. And that's not an individual expression, he's saying. That is something that takes place through Multiple people coming together and forming the vision of God in this world for relational discipleship for all time, the church of Jesus Christ. So he's saying the way in which the authority of Jesus spreads over all the world is through our submission to his authority right here and right now. And so what we are doing as the church of Jesus Christ, relating to one another, coming together with one another, being in the Word with one another, singing with one another, praying for, praying with one another. He's saying that that is a vital component and the most vital aspect of how we are going to bring the world under subjection to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. But he says something else that's so fascinating, all these things. So he's the head over all things to the church, which is his body. But he has a second phrase that he uses. And it's one that we usually pass over. The fullness of Him, or Jesus. I want you to think about this. This is vital. God has defined and designed the gospel to be that which brings Him the utmost glory for all time. That what's going on in this world through the perfect life of Jesus, through the death of Jesus, through the resurrection of Jesus, is that God wants to bring himself glory. And he has determined in eternity past that the way in which he can bring himself the most glory is for Jesus to do that. And then the ramifications of Jesus doing that would be revealed and would be seen through what we are doing, through the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus 
finds his fullness in this, through us. And we think, I am unworthy of that. Absolutely we are unworthy of that. We don't deserve that for one second. But this isn't our call. Again, this is Jesus' call. Jesus has defined that his purpose is lacking without our part in his purpose. And when Jesus looks at the church, it is the same way that I would look at myself if somebody came up here and lopped off an arm or a leg. I would be less Steve than I was before you did that. That would be a little bit less of me. And so what Jesus is doing through the church is he's looking at the church and he's saying, I am the fullness of everything of all time. And the way in which I experience that fullness, the way in which I communicate that fullness and the way in which I have that fullness is through my church in this world. And so when we act, when we do, when we disciple, when we read the scriptures, when we pray, we are being what many people have heard oftentimes. We are being the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. And here's where our problem is. If I gathered 12 of you in a room, I'm just going to assume, uh, maybe wrongly, but I'm going to assume you are all followers of Jesus Christ. Okay. And I, I got 12 of you together and we all got in a room together and I made that statement. I said, man, the church is the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. I have to believe that all 12 of you would be like, yes, we are. All right? That's just not something that we would debate. That's not something, I mean, if we did debate it, you'd be wrong. But I think it's something that you would fairly well agree to. But here's the deal. What would you be agreeing to is the problem. And, and then I got more personal. I said, this isn't something that we just need to agree with. And I started looking at all 12 of you. And I said, hey... What does that mean? I really believe I would get 12 different answers. I think that all of you would have a different answer. And I think many of those answers would be problematic because they would be rooted in who you are. They would be rooted in what your preferences are. They would be rooted in your personality type. They would be rooted in what you think your spiritual gifting is. They would be rooted in what you think you have to offer. <clears throat> they would be rooted in what you want in your life. And right there is when we get it wrong, because how does the text start? God the Father has put all things under the feet of who? You? See, the only way that you get a vote is if it's in subjection to you, if it's in submission to you. But what the text is telling us is that everything has been put to submission of Jesus he is the head. We are the body. My leg has never decided independently to do anything in my life. My head tells my leg what to do. And if, by the way, my leg did start to do things independently of what my brain tells it to do, what would we call that? A disability. We'd call that a handicap. Well, I will tell you, much of the problem for the vision that you have for the body of Christ is that your view of your discipleship and your place in building the body is handicapped. Because you try to function independently of the head because you think you have a better plan, you think you have a better process, you think you have a better personality type, and you believe that you are special, and so the rules have to change for you. So one thing I've based my entire ministry in is by offending people by looking them square in the eyes and say, here's the deal, you want me to change your life? You are not special. There is nothing special about any of you. There's only something special about Jesus Christ. So our definitions of two things. First, the purpose of the church. Secondly, the function of the church. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. The only things that matters is what the King of kings and Lord of lords thinks. We must go to Jesus for our purpose. We must go to Jesus for our function, and that is what is vital. So, let's start our outline. Number one this morning, following Jesus means building the church. Following Jesus means building the church. You are not going to follow Jesus anywhere other than the church of Jesus Christ. So if you believe this faulty notion, just me and Jesus, that's all I need, you are really overvaluing your role. You are really overvaluing who you are. Jesus wants to build His body, and that's a bigger vision than you can handle. So Jesus is lovingly putting you 
into His body. You are individually in the body, but you are a member with the whole body. The body of Christ is a vital metaphor for us to understand our place and our purpose in the church. When he says that he is the fullness of Christ, we have to begin to unpack what that actually means. Remember, we don't have the authority to define what that means and how that looks. Only Jesus does. And when we try to define it ourselves, do you know what we tend to do? We overcomplicate it. We overcomplicate it for one of two purposes. The first one is, is that we overcomplicate it so that we feel better about our place in it. And so we will begin to put other things on top of the purposes of Jesus. We will seek to redefine it. And have you, the big thing that you need to know about 2020 is messed up and as weird of a year this has been. You have, whether you realize it or not, been given a thousand new purposes that you have to fulfill in your life. And you have no hope of reaching about two of them. 2020 is a year of guilt. It's a year where we've been forced to redefine everything. It's a year where we've been told that everything that we've ever done in the history of our lives has been insufficient to meet the needs that this world actually has. And we have to reorganize and redefine every way that we approach everything so that it can meet the standard of the new image bearers, which is culture at large. But the one thing that all of that has in common is that none of it's right. Because we overcomplicate it so that we can feel better about our place in it and more unique in our purpose in this world because we want to be the center of what God is doing. We do not believe it's sufficient for God to be the center of what He is doing. And all of it is so that people can feel more special about who they are in this world. But there's a second reason that we complicate things. We tend to complicate things so that we don't have to do anything. And we really do. If it's simple, it seems attainable. If it's complicated, wow, I have an excuse. And we begin to throw things in there like, oh man, I wish I could help. I wish I had that ability. I wish I was good enough. I wish I was talented enough. I wish I could be faithful enough. I wish, because you're just throwing one thing on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, and you're acting like spiritual growth is this great mystery that nobody knows how to do, and that serving and building the body of Christ is this puzzle that no one has really fixed. Building the body of Christ is not an unfixable Rubik's Cube, friends. It's very simple. And when we overcomplicate it, we realize... That the reason that we do that, we bring in these different goals, we bring in these different actions, we bring in all these new methods, these new philosophies, these new preferences, is that we are trying to work our way out of actually thinking that it is God's standards that we must live by. If we strip down to the philosophy and methodology of the New Testament, no matter what, we see that building the body of Christ is about two things. First, it is about proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And secondly, it is about making disciples of Jesus. That's it. That's it. You say, no, it can't possibly be that simple. Well, friends, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life, so I'm not saying it's easy. But it's not more complicated than that. The church of Jesus Christ, if you look at the New Testament, if you just summarize everything in the New Testament down to two things, which is the only two things that there is, the church of Jesus Christ exists to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And the problem comes when you add a third thing. Because any third thing that you're going to add is not going to be something that's found in the Bible. It's never going to be found in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6 proclaims the personal vision for this. It says, now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. Varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. And there's two things I want you to see in that passage. The first one is that your participation in the body of Christ is vital. Your participation is vital. But secondly, when we read that text, we tend to focus on differences. We say, see, ha see, different giftings, different services, different activities. So I can just look at what I like. I can look at what I think I'm talented at. I can look at what I think I'm good at. And I can just say, I'm doing that in Jesus' name. And that's building the body of Christ. Friend, you're misreading that passage. Again, what's your problem? Your problem is, is that you're starting from a human level. What does this, pas- what does this passage have in common? Three things. Same spirit, same Lord, Same God. 
That's the commonality. He's saying that no matter what your gifting is, it's the same Holy Spirit that defines how you use that gifting. No matter what your service is, it's the same Lord that defines how you use that service. No matter what your activity is, it's the same God that defines what the purpose of that activity is for. And when you begin to see everything in the Christian life, not through the lens of me, but through the lens of God, you begin to understand you do not have the authority to just start doing things and saying whatever it is that you're doing is in the name of Jesus. Therefore, it's building the body of Christ. You can't do that because a lot of you waste a tremendous amount of time. You just do stupid things and then you try to pretend it's an important thing. None of you are allowed to just grow the greatest teddy bear collection that this world has ever seen and said, wow, amazing is this? This is my spiritual gift. And I say that because I tried to pick the dumbest metaphor possible. But that's what we do sometimes. We just try to baptize whatever we naturally want to do and say, that's my spiritual gifting. It doesn't matter what I think my spiritual gifting is. All that matters is what God says my spiritual gifting is. What God says my spiritual gifting exists for. What God says service looks like that builds His body. And what God says activity looks like that builds His body. God is the center of that passage, not me. Therefore, I am stripped of all authority. I am stripped of all autonomy in this passage. It must go to the same Spirit, it must go to the same Lord, and it must go to the same God, or it is a tremendous waste of time. If we are going to have unity, we must have unity around the purposes that God defines. Unity is not the most important thing in the world. We will be told that it is. But we can unite around the wrong things, and if we unite around the wrong things, we will have a very bad conclusion. We must ensure that if and when we do unite, because we need unity, but only if we are united under the right gospel. And the gospel of Jesus is what we must be uniting under. The overarching theme is not at a human level, but at God's level. Number two, never underestimate the power of proclaiming the gospel. Never underestimate the power of proclaiming the gospel. I'm not sure there's ever been a time in church history where there has been more freedom to preach the gospel to people. I'm also not sure that there has ever been a time in history in which we have tried to make proclaiming the gospel more complicated. When we talk about proclaiming the gospel and reaching the world and living the mission and international missions, we often start talking about the wrong things. We want to sound right. We want to dress right. We want to live in the right place. We want to drink the right drinks. We want to do the right good deeds. We want to take everybody's Enneagram number and personality profile into mind before you ever get to answer what the content of the gospel actually is. Because we want to begin around our preferences. We want to begin around what we want. Because what we are like and what we want oftentimes takes precedence over what God is like and what God wants. If you start with personality and preference in sharing the gospel with people before you start by answering the question, what is the gospel? You're never going to get to the gospel. And you might be the coolest, trendiest, most winsome, best dressed person in the culture that it's ever seen. And if you have no substance with that, you've wasted your time. You're not going to change anybody's life because you're the coolest person in the room content that matters. If we're going to reach the world, we must begin by saying, what is the gospel? And then when we get the gospel, guess what? You've gotten 99% of the answer done. Yes, strategy is important. We spend a tremendous amount of time trying to form good strategies and good postures to keep in mind in order to reach the most people. But for many, it is actually the content of the gospel that is the least of your concern when it should be your primary, utmost concern. 
The fact that we have a God who saw us in our sin and in love sent His Son to live a perfect life, to die a substitutionary death where He paid the penalty for my sin and He rose from the dead so that I could experience a new life in the Spirit so that the kingdom of heaven is promised to me forever. That is the substance and we must have the substance of the gospel. It must be the most precious thing to us. It must be the most important thing to us. And we must must have that above absolutely everything else. The root of the gospel, that, fra- that, excuse me, that term is a phrase that means good news. And here's what you need to understand. You are not good news. I am not good news. I don't have that ability. I can't save anyone. If the world was in trouble and Steve said, and everybody looks at me and says, Steve, save us. You're in trouble. In serious trouble. I I don't have that much ability, and I have a tremendous amount of apathy. And that is a bad combination. (laughs) Lack of ability with an extreme amount of apathy means you are in serious danger of dying if if your life is in my hands, all right? And so I'm not good news, but here's the deal. Neither are you because you are imperfect. You are a sinner. Therefore, you do not have the ability to save anyone. Therefore, if I go to the world and I offer it the best good deed that I can summarize, I offer it the most love that I can muster up, if I offer it everything that I have in my power, the world is condemned to hell for eternity. It is. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that God didn't leave me in that state. He provided His sacrificial lamb of a son, the perfect Savior, the Almighty God, the one whom everything could be put under His feet. And He gave Him as a sacrifice for all so that I could look to the world and I could actually, through the power of the Holy Spirit, do the simplest thing possible. I mean, you think about how simple this is. I can tell them, I have good news for you. Jesus saves. And God says, those are the most powerful things that you could ever do in this world. 1 Corinthians 1.18. Because I know some of you, because of the way culture is conditioning you, you're thinking in your head, that isn't enough. We need more than the gospel. Preaching the gospel can't fix the problems that this world has. I've even heard pastors say this over the last few months. We need more than the gospel. We need to do more than the gospel. Stop saying preaching the gospel is sufficient. Well, here's the deal. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. This is the word of the cross is folly. It's foolishness. It's stupid to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is what? The power of God. Friend, I don't understand fully the power of God. I won't pretend to this morning. There's so much mystery where the power of God is concerned uh, that I would be stupid to even try to explain the whole thing to you in my words. But I will tell you, it is amazing to me that God has the audacity to say that telling someone the good news of Jesus is His power. And that's exactly why He does it that way. He doesn't want me to get credit. He wants me to be confused by how he could do such amazing work through such a simple task. Yeah. Verse 25, 1 Corinthians 1, he says, and I, this is, I love this because God's sarcastic, and that's such a comfort to me. <laughs> it is. I wonder if God ever looks down from heaven, and if he's more sarcastic than I am. And before you think I'm a heretic, what I mean by that is, I have imperfect sarcasm. Everything I have is imperfect. But if God's sarcastic, just imagine being perfectly sarcastic. Isn't that the dream? God's living the dream. He's even perfected sarcasm, all right? And so I wonder if God, I think verse 25 is a little sarcastic. He says, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Think about that. God isn't foolish, so don't hear that from the text. What he's saying is, is that we're so dumb that the best idea we could ever come up with would be the worst idea God could ever come up with. And I wonder if God is ever up in heaven looking down at me when I'm trying to complicate spiritual growth, when I'm trying to complicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he ever looks down from heaven, he's like, oh, you think you got a better idea than me? Well, good luck with all that. 
I mean, you think how stupid we are. So many times we try to make better what God has already perfected. We try to improve on that which is already impeccable. We try to make better what God has said is finished. The same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that slew Goliath with young David's pebble, the same God that saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, the same God that sent His Son into this world, born of a virgin, living a perfect life, dying a sinner's death when He had no sin so that He could substitute Himself for me, to do the ultimate miracle of all time, to rise from the dead three days later so that life could reign eternally forever. That God looked to His disciples and said, greater works than these you're going to do. Because I'm going to design a plan of salvation where you're just going to walk around and say, hey, look at what Jesus has done. And He's going to take hearts of stone and put hearts of flesh in. He's going to take spiritual death and make spiritual life. He's going to raise the dead so that they can worship Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. That God is the one here that says, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. See, preaching the cross, being enough, seems foolish to me because I'm not God. God is showing off. God is saying, I'm going to design a plan where, Steve, your part is so simple. You just speak and His Holy Spirit will do the rest. It's the perfect plan for imperfect vessels. Preach the gospel. Finally, number three this morning. Making disciples changes the world. Making disciples changes the world. In Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 7, the apostle says that this gospel, this gospel that reconciles man with God, this gospel that makes it so that we can reconcile with other human beings. There is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is just one body of Christ. This gospel of which Paul preaches the unsearchable riches of God, this gospel which when you preach, you unveil the mystery that was hidden for ages, this gospel that when we speak, it says that the spiritual realms are looking on as spectators. Both angels and demons are looking on and saying, you mean to tell me God has designed a way to give himself glory where speech is used to tell news of what God has done and people's lives are changed forever? This gospel that is spoken and it builds the body of Christ that gospel is according to the eternal plan of God. That gospel will change the world. That is what changes the world. Then one chapter later in Ephesians chapter 4, it says that he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. He gave us all these, this is an exhaustive list. He gave all these offices, all these different giftings. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. In other words, to make disciples. And why do we make disciples? Well, we make disciples to build the body of Christ. It's this fascinating plan that God gives where I am both called to be the body of Christ, but I also build the body of Christ inside of the church of Jesus Christ. Until, verse 13, until we all attain the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the, here it is, fullness of Christ. This fullness that Jesus wants me to experience in my life. And I look at that and I say, how do we accomplish that? How do we do that? Well, first, it's through the daily work of relationships, spiritual disciplines, and a commitment to living a life of mission. See, so often we're looking for a silver bullet. We're looking for the latest strategy. We're looking for the latest trend. We're looking for this go big or go home moment where we just become on fire for God and feel it. If I was waiting to feel it, uh, I'd never do anything because I rarely feel anything. I, I Literally, I never get excited. 
I, I asked my, I, we've been married 15 years. I haven't been excited a single moment in those 15 years. Sometimes I'm afraid if I start getting excited, she'll leave me because that's not the man she married. She married the most unexcited man in the world. And two modes, grumpy and I'm asleep. Those, those are the two modes of Steve. But this isn't a lifestyle that depends on a level of excitement for me to actually become the body of Christ. Rather, it is a daily faithfulness to that which God has called me to. And the more faithful I am to the small things, and they are small things that God has called me to, the greater my spiritual growth will be. And the more faithfulness that I will experience and the more lives that I will change with my very life. The fact is that most of us simply need to get back to biblical basics on absolutely everything and radically uncomplicate what so many of us have sought to make complicated. Yes. Friend, you have to realize that the body is built through daily faithfulness to first gathering with other Christians. I mean, think about what we're doing right now. Doesn't this seem to be the most unspiritual thing you could possibly do? You're just sitting in a room with a bunch of other people listening to me. It's like, where's the, you know, this isn't the most spiritual moment of your life, probably. If it is, you're welcome. But, uh, <laughs> but some of you are just hungry, all right? And you're like, he, I'm looking, he's, the countdown's over. He's got to wrap this up, all right? And, and so y- y- you don't understand that this morning when you woke up, and I hope you made the decision to clean up after that, and then you got dressed and you got in your car and some of you somehow got three and four kids in said car. And, and you came here and some of you greeted and some of you helped people park and some of you, we played in the band and, and some of you helped us with organization behind the scenes with sound, lights, recording, live streams, stuff that you'll never see. Is that that was one step of faithfulness. That was one step of obedience. This morning, if you spent time in the Word, that was a step of obedience. If you spent time in prayer, it was a step of obedience. If you've had the thought all day, how can I serve someone? That's a step of obedience. Building the body of Christ is a thousand steps of obedience that joined together changes life. Erwin McManus has said it this way. He said, people that change the world simply change the square feet around their own feet. See, what you don't understand is magic bullets don't exist. New strategies are usually worthless. Is that it is a moment-by-moment decision in your life that I will follow Christ before I will follow anything else. And these small, seemingly infinitesimal Moments of discipleship come together over 10 years to give an amazing amount of spiritual growth that quite often maybe you didn't even notice the big moments because they seemed so small to you. You're never going to grow in one community group meeting. I know some of you, you're like, I've tried community groups. Yeah, you tried it once. And they didn't rock your socks, so you never went back. Well, that, that wasn't the design. One community group gathering isn't going to change your life. One discipleship group gathering isn't going to change your life. One Sunday morning rarely changes anyone's lives. One moment in the Word rarely changes life. One moment in prayer rarely changes lives. But if you faithfully every day commit to those things, over the years they will join together and contribute to a changed life. One thing I'll tell you, is that if you want to change other people's lives, you will be very committed to changing your own. Because the more my life changes, the more the people in my immediate network of relationships tends to change. And that my faithfulness impacts more people than I ever realized it would impact. Hebrews chapter 10, chapter 10 puts it this way. It says, let us consider or let us think about how we're going to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. I think it's interesting that the author of Hebrews also worried about attendance. He's like, yeah, some people aren't here. 
but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day draw near. This seemingly small thing, he says, is going to change lives. Because when you embrace the power of the gospel, and when you embrace people coming into the body of Christ and then teaching them, here's how you follow Christ through the word. Here's how you follow Christ through prayer. Here's how you follow Christ through worship. Here's how you follow Christ through this, that, or the other thing. You will change lives. It is the highest calling of this age. This is a call to unnatural faithfulness in a world that will find it peculiar that such simple practices invite the power of God to change our lives. Five application points. First, trust the process. Trust the process. I love that phrase because it's so vital. So often I get discouraged and so often I think I need to try something new because I don't see the big bang. You know, I don't see the immediate return. I don't have the instant gratification. Everybody that I'm discipling looks bored and I know I'm bored. And so I think maybe I should quit. I got to trust the process. I got to trust the process. Trust the process. Number two. Find a place to serve the local church. Find a place to serve the local church. It requires sacrifice. It requires commitment. We're going to call you to sacrifice and commitment. But if you will find a place and you will serve faithfully, over time you will be amazed at the impact that it will have in your life. Thirdly, commit to spiritual disciplines. Commit to spiritual disciplines. I started reading the Bible at a very young age, and it wasn't because I was, I was awesome or anything. It was because my parents had it as a core value in my life. And so I've been reading the Bible probably since I was about 10 years old, and that's about 30 years. And I will tell you, over 30 years, I have had the same strategy for spiritual growth, and it's profound. I read the Bible and I pray. All right, that's literally my entire strategy. I have never been that smart. Um, so over 30 years, I have read the Bible a few hundred times. I, I don't know how many. Um, more than once every year, I read through the Bible. And my response to that is I pray. I pray the Bible. I pray to praise. I pray to ask God for things. I pray to thank Him for things. And I tried different times throughout the day to pray for something different. It's very simple, but it does take time out of my schedule. And in that, I can tell you every ounce of faithfulness that I have is because of my commitment to those spiritual disciplines. That's it. On top of that, I have three things that I'm committed to before I'm committed to anything else in this world. And that's number four, give priority to discipleship relationships. And there's three environments that I believe harbor discipleship relationships. And those are the three environments we have at Village Church. I have been to thousands of Sunday morning services. I have been to thousands of community groups. I have been to thousands of what we call discipleship groups. And I count those as spiritual disciplines. I say no to anything that would take Sunday morning away from me. I say no to anything that will take community group away from me. I say no to anything that would take discipleship groups away from me. And the amount of growth that I have had over the two decades that I've been living like that is amazing because I have had the opportunity to see other people's lives change. But the greatest opportunity that I've had is seeing my life changed. Nothing changes your life quite like giving other people to access to who you really are. It changes everything. Then fifthly, tell someone about Jesus every week. Tell someone about Jesus every week. That's 52 times a year. It'll become far more than that. But some of you are terrified because you're like, oh no, he's telling me to tell unbelievers about Jesus. And I am. But... Understand that more than unbelievers need to hear the gospel. Christians continually need to be encouraged by the gospel. 
And some of you have a great source of encouragement that you could give into the lives of your brothers and sisters in Christ and you neglect it. Find a believer to encourage with the gospel every week. Find an unbeliever that needs to hear the gospel as well. And if you will follow these practices, friends, we will change the world because we will change our lives. And that's as much as the world as most of us will ever know. Do we believe that the gospel is enough? Every week, and I know I've gone a few minutes long, but every week we reflect on the Lord's Supper, which is called communion. And there should be a packet somewhere in the vicinity of your seat. It's our COVID safe packet. On the top of it, I promise that's bread. And then on the bottom is juice. The bread represents the broken body of Christ. The, the juice represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So when we eat and when we drink, we profess our faith to everyone in this room. And if you are a follower of Jesus, this is for you because Jesus has commanded it. But if you're in here and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, and parents, I'm going to let you deal with your children on this. But if you're in here and you're not a follower of Jesus, I, I don't want you to eat and drink because the Bible says through God that, that you're not to do that because it will be a lie. It's not something you actually believe. But if you don't believe the gospel, I want to invite you to believe the gospel. You have sinned against a holy God. And because of that, you deserve His judgment. And unless someone intervenes, that's exactly what you're headed towards, is the fiery wrath of God. But the good news is that God loves you to the extent that He sent His own Son to take your place. On the cross, Jesus took the judgment for your sin and paid the penalty. And if you will turn from your sin and trust the finished work of Jesus Christ, He will save you forever. He will give you a new life. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And there's coming a day when you will physically die. And in that moment, He will raise you to spiritual life. And you will be in His kingdom forever. If you'll believe that, He'll save you. If you're a follower of Jesus right now, eat, drink, profess your faith, and let's sing to praise God.